literally hundreds of books have been devoted to the study of acoustics, and it is a deep and expansive topic area of science. It's really physics. What I'm going to do in this video is scratch the surface and try and distill down a lot of the most exciting, interesting, actionable, and essential things from the field of acoustics and translate them from the very scientific and heady language of acousticians into plain English for you. What's up, everyone? I just wrapped up a partnership project with Sonarworks where I built an official video series for them. Many of the videos were covering topics that were related to this channel and the stuff that we talk about here. Highly relevant information that I thought would be valuable to share with you. So I asked Sonarworks for permission to be able to share the videos that I created on this channel for you and they gave me the thumbs up. This video is a deep dive into room acoustics. I cover the foundational basic information if you have never really approached the subject before. And we also get up into some fairly moderate and bridging into advanced topics that you would need to be able to design a studio like the one that I'm in. So I'm really stoked to be able to share this with you. Sonarworks is the creator of Sound ID Reference, which is one of the industry leading platforms for monitor and headphone calibration. Their technology is used in over 200,000 studios around the world by Grammy award-winning engineers for A-list artists like Lady Gaga, Rihanna, Adele, and Madonna. I'm really stoked that they gave me permission to be able to share these videos with you. Their technology is definitely something to be aware of, and I'm excited to dig into this video with you. Now, if you like this video, it and many more like it are available in a free studio design and acoustics course that I have back at Warp Academy. I'll drop a link in the description and up in the cards. Make sure you grab that course because it'll cover not only the foundations of acoustics, but it'll also cover all the information you need to be able to build your own very professional and effective DIY acoustic treatment, as well as orient your room correctly, all the good stuff to get the best out of your acoustic environment and your equipment. So without further ado, let's hop into the video. Literally hundreds of books have been devoted to the study of acoustics, and it is a deep and expansive topic area of science. It's really physics. What I'm gonna do in this video is scratch the surface and try and distill down a lot of the most exciting, interesting, actionable, and essential things from the field of acoustics and translate them from the very scientific and heady language of acousticians into plain English for you. In order to effectively do that, we're gonna narrow the scope of our discussion. So although there are many types of rooms out there that are oddly shaped, we're gonna focus our discussion on rooms that are rectangular or square. Even a lot of professional studios that could be built in any dimensions are actually built inside of rectangular isolation shells, like my room, because that actually simplifies the room mode calculations that are necessary to be able to effectively work with treating and designing the interior spaces of that room. Next, we're going to narrow our discussion from different types of speaker setups to purely a stereo pair. We're not going to be talking about the immersive or surround areas, or otherwise we could be here all week. And finally, Rather than talking about rooms that might be set up for just general recreational listening, we're gonna be focusing purely on rooms that are designed for engineering music or for critically listening, where accuracy is paramount. Sound actually works quite differently from what you might expect, making the field of acoustics quite counterintuitive. Acousticians often joke amongst themselves, saying that if something seems like it's easy to grasp and you think you've got it, it's probably wrong. This complexity is partially due to how three-dimensional sound waves propagate inside of a room and then interact with boundaries such as the ceiling, floor, sidewalls, and equipment and furniture in the room, creating a set of reflections that superimpose themselves on the direct sound that you're hearing from the monitors. All of this, we try and represent it using simple-looking two-dimensional and three-dimensional graphs and charts, but oftentimes there's a much deeper level that's going on underneath the surface, meaning that acoustics can be a little bit difficult to grasp. For example, sound waves are often visually depicted like waves in an ocean, sinusoidally rising and falling. Whereas in reality, sound wave propagation actually functions more like an earthworm as it pushes forwards, creating a compression zone in front of it and leaving a low pressure zone behind it before it begins the cycle again. Beyond the field of acoustics, you have psychoacoustics, how our unique anatomy, senses, and brain perceive the sound. You're hearing the room as much as you're hearing the speakers, and how that particular room has a unique way of coloring the sound. Unless you're listening inside an anechoic chamber, you're going to have some reflections as sound waves encounter your walls, ceiling, floor, equipment, and furniture in the room. The walls and ceiling and floor from here on in we're just going to refer to as boundaries. 
What happens next after a sound wave strikes something depends on the acoustic properties of the material or combination of materials that it strikes. Usually a portion is absorbed, a portion is reflected, and a portion is transmitted or passes through something you might call sound bleed in layman's terms to whatever's on the other side. Another really important layer to this is that almost everything in acoustics is frequency dependent. So the portions of sound that are absorbed, reflected, or transmitted will depend on the acoustic properties of those materials and they will be different for each frequency range. I'll give you a couple of examples. If sound strikes a regular residential wall that's made of wood timber framing and drywall, that's going to reflect back into the room a good portion of the mid and high frequencies. However, the bass energy will be able to pass through it at a much greater degree because drywall can act like a low frequency pressure-based diaphragmatic absorber and it also has a low frequency of resonance. Whereas materials in the room like fiberglass, rock wool, drapes, or furniture will oftentimes be very absorptive at higher frequencies. The proportion of sound in a given frequency range which is absorbed is known as the absorption coefficient, and the proportion of sound in a frequency range that's reflected is known as the reflection coefficient. So what's more here, and this is key to understand as well, is that the absorption and reflection properties of a material depend on the angle at which the sound wave is striking them. So it's also dependent on the angle of incidence. The first big topic to discuss is room modes. These are also known as standing waves, and they occur between two parallel room boundaries, when you can fit at least a half cycle of the frequency between those boundaries. And the reason they occur is because that frequency, when it perfectly fits between the two boundaries, is able to bounce back and forth and be reinforced by the reflected energy. And what that does is it self-amplifies or creates a resonant frequency that can result in a much higher amplitude than that frequency in a room where the boundaries don't correspond to a half cycle or multiples of that cycle of that waveform. Why are room modes important? Well, the goal in control room design in any room that's designed for critical listening is an even frequency response, a flat frequency response. You don't want to have any frequencies that are jumping out over and atop of other things. Otherwise, that may influence your decisions of how you're setting things on your mixing effects and on your board. So the goal in control room design is to use acoustic treatment, irregular surfaces like uh, diffusers, and to be able to use mainly absorption to be able to curtail these room modes. Note that I said curtail there and not eliminate because room modes actually aren't the enemy. They can provide some useful support for certain frequencies. When you have room modes that are, that are self-amplifying, they can actually give some help to the speakers and the sound that they're propagating into your room. The problem with room modes is typically in the low end where the room modes become much more spaced out. There's gaps between them and you have these irregular or lumpy results in your frequency response that really take you away from that nice even response that we're going for. As you move higher up in the frequency spectrum and the modes get closer together and there's more modal density, they tend to couple with each other and create a much more even and smooth response. So we really focus our discussion on room modes oftentimes down in the low end. Now, the types of room modes I was just speaking about between two parallel surfaces are what are referred to as axial room modes, and those are the strongest and the most problematic. But there's two other forms of room modes. There's tangential room modes, which involve striking at least four surfaces, and then there's oblique room modes, which involve striking all six surfaces. So we're talking about wall, 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 floor, ceiling, not necessarily in that order. That creates an oblique mode. And the more surfaces that sound strikes means the further that sound has to travel and the more surfaces it's encountering where it will be absorbing some of the energy. So typically as it strikes more surfaces and travels more distance, the sound is losing energy and it's also being partially absorbed and not perfectly reflected. So again, those axial room modes are the ones that are the most strong and the most problematic because they occur between two surfaces. Modes can really skew your perception of sound in the room. There's a test that I'd like you to do. You can go and find an online tone generator, really easy if you just Google those terms, and find something that can generate a sine sweep that goes from zero to 500 hertz very, very slowly. And what I want you to do is play that test tone and then move around to different areas of your room. 
and what you're gonna hear is certain frequencies in certain areas of the room are really gonna jump out and other frequencies are going to disappear either partially or almost totally. There's a sweet spot in your room that you wanna find when you're setting up your mix position where the modes are the most balanced, okay? And you only can really determine this through experimentation and the best way to do that is to use real sound and to move around your room. How I do this with my clients is I start by finding the 38% point through the room from the front wall, okay? So you measure from the front wall to the back wall, you take the 38% mark or thereabouts and you begin there and then you create what's called a line of symmetry. So I use a piece of tape along the floor. I extend out a few feet forwards and backwards of that 38% mark. And I mark every 10 inches on the tape. And then up and down that line of symmetry, you're gonna move your position, your listening position while you're doing the sine wave sweep. And you're gonna listen for the position. You can make notes on a piece of paper where the frequencies from zero to 500 Hertz sound the most balanced to you. That's a, a really good way to actually use your ears and to find the sweet spot in your room so that you can even out the effect of all of those modes. Have you ever heard the advice that you shouldn't listen in a square room? Well, that's because of overlapping room modes. So imagine you're in a square room and the front to back walls are three meters apart and the side to side walls are also three meters apart. Well, those are your two axial modes, right? Those are two of the axial modes. You also have floor to ceiling. And the frequency that corresponds to that, the resonant frequency is 114 Hertz. So you're gonna have not one, but two modes that are overlapping with each other at the exact same center frequency on 114 Hertz. And they're going to amplify much more than a single mode, okay? Now imagine you also have a three meter ceiling and floor height. Well, now you have a third axial mode that's stacking on top. But what about the other modes that I talked about? In that same three by three by three meter room, you'd also have three overlapping tangential modes at 81 Hertz and no less than four overlapping tangential modes at 128 Hertz. So what that can result in is huge peaks and nulls in your frequency response in the room of up to about 30 decibels. The smaller the room, the more likely it is that you're gonna have stacked room modes and the more problematic those room modes are gonna be. When professional rooms are being designed from the ground up, it's common to use special ratios known as golden ratios that allow a modal distribution that avoids stacking. There are some other approaches that professional studio designers will take though. One of them is to add heavy acoustic treatment to all of the boundaries or most of the boundaries in a room, creating what's called a non-environment room. And that way the modes are so heavily damped that you don't need to worry as much about golden ratios. And that's what has been done in my room. We chose instead to optimize the amount of interior room volume rather than pay attention to special golden ratios. And we added a lot of deep trapping in the room, which has really brought down the activity of the modes. Another approach that you'll see is called an RFZ, which stands for reflection free zone. And that uses a shaped shell inside the isolation shell where you have surfaces that are out of parallel, especially in the front end of the room that will reflect energy away from the listening position such that you don't have any direct reflections arriving where the mix engineer would sit. Another aspect of room dimensions is modal density. It's generally desirable for the number of room modes to logarithmically increase as frequency increases. That greater density can create a smoother sound. And this is something known as the Bonello criterion. In general, as you increase the density of modes as they get closer and closer to each other, they will oftentimes couple with each other and excite together rather than jumping out and resonating in isolation. There are many reasons to add acoustic treatment to your room, but one of the biggest ones has to do with modal bandwidth. So modes have a bandwidth to them and they have a peak. And as you begin to damp that mode by adding acoustic absorption to the room, you widen the bandwidth of that mode while bringing the peak down. Why is that important? Well, the skirts of that mode now then are more likely to overlap with the skirts of adjacent modes, allowing them to mutually couple and mutually excite rather than jumping out and resonating all on their own. Again, this leads to a much smoother frequency response, which is why rooms with heavy acoustic treatment in them sound so much better. 
Now let's talk about reflections. What you're hearing inside any room is a combination of the direct, unaltered sound from the speakers and the combination of the cumulative effect of all of the reflected energy in the room. Anytime sound travels around a room and strikes something, it's colored by the acoustic properties of the material or materials that it encounters. So it's changing not only in level, it's changing in spectral distribution as well. Another factor to consider is that as sound propagates through a room, and it's reflected back to you, or it is arriving at the listening position at the same time as the direct sound from the monitors, it also is going to be at a different phase relationship to the original direct sound. And that shift in phase is going to be frequency dependent, just like everything else in acoustics. And so you're gonna have opportunities for destructive and constructive interference depending on the phase relationship between the reflected and direct energy. The first type of reflection we wanna talk about is called flutter echo. If you clap your hands in between two reflective and parallel surfaces, you're gonna hear exactly what I mean. The reflections that correspond to the distance between the boundaries are such that when they're reflected back and forth very frequently, they create a pitch or a tone. And for that reason, we want to avoid flutter echo in any studio environment. It's pretty easy to avoid flutter echo. You can do it usually by just placing porous absorption on even one of the surfaces or by using diffusion and creating an irregularity to one of the surfaces or both of the surfaces such that the sound gets broken up rather than a specular direct reflection. Next, let's talk about comb filtering. Comb filtering happens anytime you have two sounds arriving and one of them is at a slight delay. So how might that occur in a music studio? Most commonly, it occurs off of your sidewalls, your floor, your ceiling, or most commonly, your desk. So you have the direct sound path traveling directly to your ears, and then you have the same sound if the desk is in the reflection path of the speakers, which a lot of desks are, strikes the desk, creating a specular reflection, angle of incidence equals angle of reflection, right up to you, and it's several milliseconds behind the direct signal, but more or less spectrally very similar or identical to the direct signal. That's going to create a set of closely spaced destructive and constructive interferences that actually have a shape that looks like a comb, hence the name. How do you avoid comb filtering? Through the use of strategically placed acoustic treatment. You would use a mirror sitting at the mix position and then you would have a friend be able to position the mirror along your sidewalls and along your ceiling such that at the point where you can see the speaker from the mix position you're going to place an acoustic panel there, typically using porous absorption. So this can be done on your sidewalls and your ceiling easily. You can use a ceiling cloud. But what about the desk? OK, and what about the floor? So typically we prevent a direct specular reflection from the floor by positioning the mixing console or your desk in that reflection path. That does a pretty good job of blocking it. And then the desk itself, if you design your desk tastefully, and according to acoustics best practices, you're either going to angle the desk surface or you're gonna bring the desk low enough such that the specular reflection will bounce out below your ears at around shoulder height. So this desk you see behind me, this is a custom built console. It's been built very low. There's no keyboard tray underneath it. It's been vented in areas where sound might make contact with it. And the desk is positioned in a way that any sound that strikes it in the reflection path bounces out way below my shoulders and is absorbed by my back wall treatment modules. In general, you need to pay attention to and address any strong early reflections. What do I mean by that? Well, in acoustic testing, if you're using RoomEQ Wizard, you're gonna look at the ETC or the energy time curve graph. And what you're gonna see is any spikes in frequency that are say within about 20 decibels of the main original dry signal called the impulse. And you wanna scan for anything within about the first 20 milliseconds. And you wanna be able to deal with those because those are gonna obscure your perception of the direct sound. So if you notice any particularly strong early reflections, you need to source out where those are coming from in your room and add acoustic treatment to those surfaces to be able to address that. Another big topic to discuss when it comes to reflections is SBIR, or Speaker Boundary Interference Response. And that happens when the speaker is located between you and a reflective boundary, such that you get a reflection off of that boundary, rejoining out of phase with the dry signal, causing what's referred to as boundary nulling. You're always going to get a big null and a big peak as a result of the out of phase waveform superimposing itself on the dry signal. So when you see a lot of studios that have their monitors on the meter bridge of the console or they're on stands and they're several feet or more from the front wall, that's a recipe for disaster when it comes to SBIR. And for that reason exactly, 
That's why you see my monitors that are mounted flush in the front boundary wall. And I have only direct sound. There's no reflection because the monitor is literally in the wall. To go into a bit of a deeper dive on this and to see the acoustic testing surrounding this issue, I'll link you to another video below this one. I did a full deep dive video on SBIR in partnership with Sonarworks and showing the results of moving a speaker from right against the wall, which would be my recommended place to put it if it's not gonna be in the wall like this, and stepping that monitor out two feet and then four feet from the wall. Watch that video if you wanna learn more about SBIR and how to correct it. Now let's talk about the two ways we have of describing sound wave propagation in a room. You have one room, but effectively two different sound fields that are operating within that room. So at mid and high frequencies, you have sound wave propagation that we describe in terms of ray acoustics. Things operate much more like light, like a laser beam, where you have a specular angle of incidence, you have a reflection that equals the angle of incidence. So angle of reflection equals angle of incidence. And then you have the bass frequencies that operate in terms of wave acoustics. And they operate a lot more like, imagine water sloshing around in a bathtub. And the type of ray acoustics that we would use to describe the upper frequencies break down and don't work for these lower frequencies. Now there's a transition frequency in your room at the point where we transition from one analysis method to another, and that's what's known as the transition frequency or the Schroeder frequency, okay? So below the Schroeder frequency in a room, and it's different for each room, you describe the low frequency energy propagation using wave acoustics. When you do acoustic testing on your room, you can actually kind of visually spot where the transition frequency is because you can see the effect of these higher density room modes in the upper frequencies transition into independently, largely spaced out room modes in the base frequencies. So you can always do it by just looking at the frequency response in your room and that point where you start to see the modes separate from each other, you can see distinct peaks. That's how you know you've entered into to the wave acoustics region below the Schroeder frequency. You know how earlier we were talking about room modes and how they occur between two parallel surfaces for the axial room modes and that creates a frequency of resonance? Well, the same thing can happen in closets, in windowsills, and other little acoustical cavities in your room. It can even happen in ceilings and floors where you have joists that are a parallel to each other, and if they're not damped by something, they can actually create little resonant chambers. That's something else to pay attention to in your studio. Typically, if you have something like that, you're gonna wanna add some type of damping material to it. Closets oftentimes are filled with clothes. Those work great, but if you have an open cavity with nothing else in it, then you could fill that with rock wool or fiberglass and enclose that with fabric so that that cavity doesn't resonate. And in general, you wanna pay attention to these because they can just add a spiky frequency to the otherwise smooth and flat frequency response you've created in your room. Now let's talk about decay time. You hear the term RT60 used a lot by novices, and we don't actually use that term in the field of control room and music studio design because R stands for reverb, and these types of rooms don't meet the criteria for reverberation. So we use the term T60 or T20 or T30, and all that means is the amount of time that a certain frequency takes to decay by 60 or 30 or 20 decibels. And in general, you need to pay very close attention to the frequency specific rates of decay inside of your room. In an earlier video where we were talking about psychoacoustics, one of the psychoacoustic principles is that a frequency that takes longer to decay, we perceive it as louder. And that creates big problems for you in being able to mix or engineer music inside of that space. So one of the primary design goals we have for control rooms is that you have a very even decay of all frequencies in the room. What helps you to do that? Acoustic treatment. That helps add a huge amount of control. When you have a decent amount of porous absorption, wide band absorption in a room, you'll see an almost razor sharp, even level of decay through all the frequencies until you get down right into the bass range. Anytime you're dealing with those really long bass waveforms, the amount of space underneath that waveform equates to power. So very, very short frequencies, which are high frequencies, there's not a lot of power there. But when you take a big like 60 Hertz or 40 Hertz bass wave, the amount of power underneath that bass wave is huge, which means the types of absorption that you need to be able to effectively attenuate that are also large. In my room on the back wall, which is going to account for the most amount of absorption from the speakers because they're pointed directly at it, we have over three and a half feet or over a full meter of porous absorption and a bit of diffusion. 
and that's enough to be able to flatten out the low end of my room at even high sound pressure levels. Now that's not practical for a lot of rooms, which means that a lot of rooms are gonna have some gain in the low frequencies. Not only they're gonna have amplitude gain, but they're gonna have decay that takes longer to ring out than the other frequencies in the room. And that's just a normal acoustic property of a lot of studios that you need to keep in mind and account for. In terms of decay and resonance, another thing to keep an eye out for in your acoustic testing is mechanical resonances from equipment. Every item, in your studio has a frequency or frequencies of resonance. Even walls have frequencies of resonance. So whenever that particular frequency is being excited or propagated into the room, it can allow that piece of equipment or surface or item to begin to vibrate and self amplify that frequency. So one of the things that we do when we're testing a control room is we'll do a very high SPL, I'm talking like 90 dB SPL, sine wave sweep up to about 500 Hertz very slowly. And then you're listening around the room for anything that starts to vibrate. It could be a desk, it could be another piece of equipment, a keyboard stand. And in general, you wanna add damping by adding mass to that item so that it's not coloring your frequency response in the room unnecessarily. To add a final note about decay times, what types of decay times should you be looking for? What should your goal be? Well, in a typical living room, recreational listening room, you might see a 0.5 to 0.7 second decay time, and that might be okay for that room. But for critical listening to music, mixing and mastering, that length of decay is going to significantly mask your perception of transients and other frequencies. That decay time is too long, so you need to be able to shorten it. In a control room, you typically are looking for decay times that are 150 to maybe upwards of 300 milliseconds in most of the frequency bands with maybe a little bit of a lift and a slightly longer decay in the bass and sub range. Now in reverberation chambers, concert halls, and uh, cathedrals, you might be dealing with times that are in the eight second to 10 second range, and that's fine. But again, you have to think about rooms that are designed for critical listening. You need to be able to hear the direct sound coming from the speakers that is unblurred and unmasked by the diffuse energy inside of that room. As I'm sure you've surmised through the various parts of this video, one of the regions that is the most difficult to treat is the bass region, just because of the amount of power and because of how difficult it is to be able to rein in and attenuate those frequencies. Yet, at the same time, according to the research that Floyd Toole has done, the perception of evenness in bass frequencies accounts for at least 30% of the musical experience when you're listening to the full range of frequencies. So it's also a range that is very, very critical to be able to get right. How do we deal with bass? Well, you have to understand where bass accumulates. So modes terminate in corners. Bass will then also begin to accumulate in corners. Anytime there's a room seam, like a wall-to-wall -wall or a floor-to-wall-to-wall -to -wall ceiling, wall-to-wall uh, -wall seams, that's where bass is going to accumulate. And you typically want to avoid putting speakers in any one of those locations because those will maximally excite the room modes. But you also want to be able to add acoustic treatment or prioritize adding acoustic treatment to those areas. And for that reason, you oftentimes see bass trapping added to corners. Now, one big mistake people make with bass traps is putting a little corner bass trap right in the center of a wall seam. So from the floor to the ceiling right in the center. Well, the most important area is actually to treat are the tri-corners of the room. And for that reason, if you're gonna be adding bass trapping, add it floor to ceiling, all the way up and as thick as you can. There's an interplay with porous absorption between the amount of depth that you have and the frequency that it can absorb. So the thicker your porous absorption, the better it's gonna be able to absorb low frequencies. That's why on my back wall, we have over three and a half feet of porous absorption. Now at the same time, Another big mistake people make with acoustic treatment is using material that's too high density when they go big in terms of depth. So as you get deeper with your porous absorption, you need to also decrease the amount of density. So if you're creating bass trapping, you typically wanna go very, very deep, but lighter density. So you'd wanna move away from items like rock wool and move towards items like pink fluffy fiberglass. Now we've talked mostly about speakers in rooms in this video, but I wanna to touch on headphones here as we wrap things up. Headphones really are just little rooms inside ear cups attached to the side of your head. And they actually do have some of the same acoustical issues and properties that rooms do with speakers in them. 
So if you have ear cups, and inside the ear cups you have two parallel surfaces, there will be standing waves inside those. So headphone manufacturers oftentimes will do things like angling the ear cup edges. Odyssey does that in their LCD5 headphones to great effect. Or they'll do things like venting the back of a closed back headphone to allow a little bit of the sound energy to transmit out. Or usually the best headphone designs that are used for mixing and mastering are the ones that are open back. And they deal with a lot of the issues because inside of a room, the sound en energy is trapped inside. And all you can do is try and attenuate it using acoustical materials. However, with headphones that are open back, they allow a huge portion of the sound energy just to vent out and escape, resulting in a much more even and controlled frequency response inside the ear cups. But even in headphones that are closed back, you can add acoustical damping materials similar to how you would do with acoustical treatment in a room. We're going to bring the conversation to a close here. I want to commend you for making it this far in the video. It's a lot of information to receive, and I really did do my best to be able to distill things down into just the essential information. The field of acoustics is much more broad than this, and if you feel passionate or inspired by the material presented so far and you want to level up, I definitely encourage you to start pulling on some of the threads, reading some of the books, and getting deeper into this subject because it really will benefit you as a lover of music or somebody who's working in the industry. Whew. All right, deep dive complete. Congratulations for making it through that. And I really wanted to take a lot of the information that I've learned from years of study and reading big fat textbooks over and over and over again, many of them, and just bring you the, the really actionable and key information about acoustics. And that that's as my best crack that I could do at it. I hope it all made sense to you. Please give the video a thumbs up if you liked it. Drop me some comments below. Anything that you need clarified. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there that might not make sense on first glance. So please do ask. I'll do my best to cover all of the questions. Don't forget about that free acoustics and studio design course back at Warp Academy. The link is in the description and up in the cards. And it is your logical next step to plow into when you are building a studio or you want to take your existing room and just get better results. Sign up for the course. Much love, happy music making, and I'll catch you on the next video. Cheers.